You are listening to the IFH Podcast Network. For more amazing filmmaking and screenwriting podcasts, just go to ifhpodcastnetwork.com. You're listening to the Marty is an award-winning filmmaker, professor, and journalist. Uh, Marty has also produced over 11 films, including uh, Being Michael Madsen, which actually stars Michael Madsen, and David Carradine. Uh, Also, Marty has taught film at Stage32.com, and Marty holds an MFA from Florida State University and a BA in journalism from the University of Connecticut. And he just released his movie, Rising Star. Marty, how are you, sir? I'm doing great, Dave. How are you? Pretty good, thanks. Well, uh, you have a pretty good resume. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> so, uh, you know, Marty, just to um, you know, get started, could you give us a little bit about your background and, and you know, uh, how you got started? Yeah. Um, I, uh, I grew up in Connecticut, um, and pretty much my, my whole time growing up, I always wanted to be a writer. Um, I always wanted to be a journalist. That was kind of the first goal that I had. And uh, I got lucky with that right after I got out of college. Uh, I actually started writing for the New York Times which was really cool. Um, and while I was doing that, um, I had thought, you know, it might be cool. I had always, I, I well, the, the thing that kind of got everything started was I had done an interview with the actress, Amy Brenneman. Uh, she's on the leftovers right now on HBO. And at the time she was on a show called judging Amy that was actually set in Connecticut. So she was coming back uh, to Connecticut to get an honorary degree from um, Trinity college. I believe it was a school here in Connecticut. And the times asked me to go into Manhattan and do an interview with her just to kind of find out, you know, what she was thinking and what it was like growing up because she grew up in Connecticut as well. Uh, so I had lunch with her, talked with her for about two and a half hours, like just such a nice woman, really, really great person. And at the end of the interview, I, I just kind of asked her, so what's it like working in the film business? Because I, ne- I never really knew. I had never you know, had any real contact with the business before. And she told me what it was like. And she told me some of the different positions and, you know, kind of what life on set was like. And and after I wrote that story, I was like, you know, this might be something cool to try. So uh, I bought a copy of The Hollywood Reporter uh, after the interview. And I found that there was one film being made in Connecticut. Uh, and there was an email address for the director. So I emailed him. I said, Hey, you know, you don't know me. I just graduated from college. Um, I have a journalism degree, but I want to learn more about movies. I'd like to work with you and you don't have to pay me. So uh, he called me a couple days later and I started volunteering on the film, uh, ended up doing, I was a boom operator on the film. I was the post coordinator. And two years later, after we finished, I actually got a producer credit on it. And that kind of started the whole thing. So it's sort of like, you know, who you know and basically just working way up the ladder. Uh, you know, I, I find that out too. Basically, if you do offer, you know, if you do approach someone with value, you know, like you say, working for free, it's amazing the doors that you can open rather than, you know, uh, going and you know what I mean, Marty? Oh, yeah. I, the, the, rule, the rule that I tell everybody is uh, people will let you do almost anything for them if they don't have to pay you. <laughs> <laughs> So, so Marty, how did you go about, you know, like actually putting together and producing one of your first films? Well, before I got into film school at Florida State, uh, I had produced three indie features. Um, and pretty much, you know, the way I did those is pretty much the way I do them now. Like you find out where you're filming. You know, you find out, you talk with your director and you find out what their connection is to their local area. And then you just start working and meeting the people that they know and the people in the local area that have influence, whether it's governmental or business or, you know, anything else. And just try to make friends because those friends will be the people that help you get the things that you need to make your movie. Like um, I produced a movie called Tommy Hobson uh, back in 2001, the summer of 2001. And uh, we had talked with there was a big scene that took place uh, at a high school on a high school football field. And our office was literally a thousand feet away from the high school of the town that we were filming in. And the director had gone to high school there. So he was talking about going to the mayor's office and going through Parks and Recreation and paying for a permit to use the field. I said, no, wait a minute. There's another way we can do this. 
So we went in because he knew one of the assistant principals that was still teaching there, you know, who had taught there when he was a student there. We went in and talked to them and we were able to use the field for free. So that's, you know, that, that was kind of a big way, a, you know, a big thing that I learned quickly was you can get a lot more done through friends and friends of friends than trying to go the quote unquote official way, you know, to get things done. Now, did, uh, Morty, did they ask you to have insurance to uh, when you film there? Uh, that high school did, and we we did have insurance anyway. Um, I haven't used insurance on all of my films, but that one we did. You know, it, it's interesting because uh, you know one of the best things I've ever heard about filmmaking, especially if you're going to make your first film, is make that Rodriguez list, which is basically all the uh, locations or any other items that you have yep. that you could actually access for free or maybe at a very low cost. And, you know, that, that's great because, you know, a resourceful producer like yourself, you know, thought of that like, hey, why don't we just try to see what we can do to get this for free? Yep. And um, I mean, you know, when stuff like that actually works out, it, it's it's unbelievable, uh, especially if anyone's listening who's, ever, who's preparing for their first film or what have you. When you can actually get something that adds production value for free, like the, the, you just feel ecstatic and then you can, you know, hopefully take carry on that confidence, you know, the, like they say, the best way to build confidence is a lot of easy, small victories. So you're always parlaying that into another, you know, victory, and then you start working your way up to the harder victories. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> and it's funny, you know, it's funny that you mentioned, you know, finding your resources as as a producer. I feel I learned something as a director that actually helped me a lot. You know, as a director making films, I actually did one project, the the feature film I made, Rising Star. I sort of reverse engineered it. <laughs> Like I tried to figure out, okay, what places could I get access to? What places could we shoot in? That sort of thing. And then I built the film around those things that I had. So it was a little different way to, to go about writing the film, you know, as opposed to creating the entire story in your head and then trying to find the elements that'll fit it. I kind of did it the reverse. And, you know, I did it for locations. I did it for cast. I didn't actually cast anyone. I wrote every role for a friend of mine. And by the time we were done, you know, everything production wise was a lot easier. And the story had sort of created itself out of those elements that I had. So that was kind of a cool experience. Well, that is very cool. Yeah. So, you know, just going ahead, when you, when you produced um, Being Michael Madsen, you know, how did that whole project come to fruition? Uh, I mean, did somebody come to you with the project or did you, you know, come to somebody else with the project? Uh, I, the director of the film, uh, Mike, he, um, he used to run a film festival uh, in New Haven, Connecticut for a number of years. And when I moved home from film school, I had one of my film school movies play in his festival and it actually won an award. So when, uh, when the whole thing was done, we were, we were just having lunch and we were chatting and he told me that he had a film coming up that he wanted to do. Uh, and at the time he actually had Alec Baldwin attached to it instead of Michael Madsen. Uh, so the original film was being Alec Baldwin, believe it or not. So I, he said, you know, would you be interested in producing this with me? And, and I was ecstatic and I said, absolutely. I'd love to. Um, and it was pretty much, you know, Mike, Mike and I working, you know, he was kind of working the talent side because I was really green at that time. So he was working with agents and managers and stuff like that. And I was sort of the, the line producer handling all the, you know, the on the ground logistical things, that sort of stuff. Uh, and it was great. We shot uh, most of it in Connecticut, but we shot part of it in Los Angeles. So we actually had the chance to go on both coasts to film. So that was great. Uh, and it was just a real cool, you know, indie experience. So being being Michael Madsen, is, is that a takeoff of being John Malkovich? Not at all, believe it. <laughs> yeah, that, that story uh, is about – uh, there's a group of documentary filmmakers that are hired by Michael Madsen to stalk a paparazzi who's been stalking Madsen. And it's really cool because it, it's it's a very meta film, but it's really neat because the uh, this, uh, this paparazzi kind of has the tables turned on him and he gets to experience what it's like to be followed around and stalked and bothered all the time as if he was a celebrity. So it was really – it was kind of a neat – you know, statement on, on what celebrities like these days. It was cool. Oh, well, that's pretty interesting. I was, I, when I saw the title, I was, I haven't seen the movie, but I was wondering if, if there was a similarity, like there's a room we go into and you can be Michael Madsen for a couple hours. Oh my gosh. I don't know how that movie would have turned out. Um. <laughs> <laughs> so, and also, uh, you know, Marty, uh, you know, uh, you, you and I were talking about how you were a teacher at, at one point. Mm -hmm. 
And, uh, you know, could you, could you take us through that and actually, you know, uh, how did you get the job of teaching? And also, you know, uh, how did you actually structure your curriculum? Well, um, I started teaching a couple months after I got back from film school. So it was the beginning of 2005. Um, I had talked with a woman who taught at Quinnipiac University um, in Hamden, Connecticut. And we knew each other because we had worked at different film events uh, before I had left for school. And, you know, we were friendly, you know, and I when I came back, I, I asked her, you know, I said, listen, can you give me some advice? You know, I'm interested in getting involved in teaching. Is there anything you can tell me that could help? She said, yes, yeah, send me your resume. I'll give you a job. So that was pretty much all I needed to get in. It was, you know, I knew someone who was on the faculty and, you know, she knew that I was just out of school. Uh, and was looking for an opportunity. Um, as far as curriculum, there were a number of different classes that I taught when I was there. Uh, some of them I had the opportunity to create myself. Um, I had taught uh, a film and sports seminar class where we watched a lot of the great sports movies and we sort of broke down, you know, I, the, the way athletes are portrayed in film and, you know, how those the stories are, you know, as primal as, you know, a lot of the action movies that you see, those kinds of things, the, sort of the similarities of that. Um, and that was a lot of fun. I, I had put together a producing the narrative film class, which I really enjoyed. And that was basically taking students through all the things that you need to do to produce a movie, uh, including dealing with unions and, you know, figuring out location fees and dealing with budgets. And that was great because our, uh, our end of the class project was, I gave groups of three or four students a completed screenplay and they put together a producing and marketing plan for it based on the script. So that was really cool. I had a lot of fun teaching that class. Um, but there's all kinds, you know, I've taught screenwriting classes, producing classes, you know, uh, basic production classes, learning about basics of lighting and editing and sound and those kinds of things. You know, it's just pretty much whatever the school needs. So, so when you had them put together that marketing plan, uh, the groups of students were all given the same exact screenplay and they were supposed to come up with like, uh, each come up with like a different marketing plan. No, no, no. They all got different ones. We, uh, I gave out, uh, there were comedy scripts, mysteries, science fiction, dramas, all different kinds of scripts. And the reason I did that was I wanted the kids to see kind of the differences in approach based on the kind of story that you're telling. So obviously you'll have a different plan if you're making a comedy script than if you're making a science fiction script. There's differences in the people that you're trying to reach, differences in the budget, you know, depending on visual effects and things like that. So it was it was good for the kids to see the other finished projects to kind of learn there are differences, you know, in making different kinds of movies. So just to clarify, this was still the like still uh, in, in the script phase, meaning you're pitch you're actually trying to get them to market the script to get to like producers and stuff, correct? No, no. This was this project was I hand you a feature script and I tell you you're going to get the money to make this. You tell me how much you need, justify why you need it, and then put together a marketing plan for me that can show that you'll make that money back. So when they were working as if they were producers you know like they were making a film out of that script oh, that's also, a good idea yeah it was fun we they had a great time and they learned a lot from it interesting, interesting. Yeah. so so when you taught the um the screenwriting class you know uh could you give us an overview of like you know what you actually taught in that in that course sure um we um since we only had four months uh what we did was it was a two-class uh progression where in the first screen, uh, screenwriting one class, which is what I taught, the final project of the class was to write the first 40 pages of a feature. And then if you were to take screenwriting two, you would finish that script and then have a completed one over the course of two classes. So basically it takes a school year to write a feature. Um, in, the, in the class that I taught, there was a lot of you know, kind of drilling on the basics of dramatic writing, you know, making sure that when you're writing a scene that, you know, you're, you're showing things and not telling them. Uh, we watched a couple movies to kind of discuss structure. Um, I, I remember we showed them uh, Chinatown. We showed them The Matrix and uh, Fargo were the films that we would watch in the class and just kind of talk about, you know, the way the films are structured, the way characters are, are shown, um, and really, you know, kind of drill into them the idea that this is not a novel, you know, everything, everything that you write down needs to be shown there needs to be motion. Everything needs to be dramatized. It's not, you know, it's not like a book where you're, you're reading the thoughts inside someone's head, you know, everything needs to be 
visualized. Everything has to be conveyed by pictures. So, it, you know, just trying to, you know, work with the basics and then and see what they come up with. So did you go to any any specific screenwriting uh, books like either a story by McKee or Save the Cat or, you know, uh, or any of Sid Field's books? Did you use any of those in the course? We did. Um, I used uh, Sid, uh, Sid Field's screenplay was one of the books that I had them buy and read. And then I would use elements from story and I actually would use elements from Save the Cat as well. Uh, the Save the Cat stuff was what I would use at first because that is sort of a – I feel that's a, it's not as much of a drill down as story or, uh, or screenplay is. And that kind of gets the, the kids in the mood of thinking, you know, in terms of, okay, what type of story is this? What events are you going to see in a script? You know, and, and I had them reading a lot, you know, so that, that was, those three books were the ones that I focused on. Yeah. Right, cool. cool. Yeah, it, it's always interesting to talk to to professors and and people who've taught screening courses. I'm always interested to see you know what actual materials they were using. Um, like I, I've had professors on from uh, who used to teach at uh, UCL uh, USC, and um, you know some of them taught the USC method, which is the eight sequencing method. Yep. yep. And some uh, you know like, uh, Chris Soth was the guy I had on from there, and he actually has his own method now, which is the mini movie method. But it, uh, I'm always interested to see you know the different approaches to actually screenwriting because i mean you know you and i could go into amazon right now and there's literally probably a couple hundred books about screenwriting at least yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, and it is it is interesting too because the the you have different kinds of teachers in screenwriting classes you have people that have you know that have been writers that teach and you get one style of right of teaching from them you get another kind of teaching from people who've worked in production because they understand what it's like when you get a film actually and you actually have to make it. And then you get yet another version if you get someone who's worked in development. You know, and what's, what's kind of cool is that I've worked in all three. So I was able to sort of drop little pieces of each of those viewpoints in while we were teaching the class. We had a really great uh, visiting professor. Uh, his name is Greg Johnson. Uh, and he produced the movie The Squid and the Whale. And he's a wonderful guy. And I was able to bring him in and he was able to talk to the kids about, you know, kind of the business side of screenwriting. So you're thinking a little bit in terms of, OK, what's my approach if I write something that I really love? How do I get it made? How do I get it seen? You know, so there's, you know, there's different approaches you can have depending on where what your viewpoint is. Oh, yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. cool. You got to have him come in and speak to the class. Um, it's been Squid in the Whale, by the way. It's a phenomenal movie. Yeah, uh, and Greg, Greg is such a nice guy. We ended up, um, we formed a company together actually a couple of years after meeting in that class. So yeah, he's just a wonderful guy. Did, now, did you make a movie with the um, with the company you guys make? Did you guys uh, produce a movie? We did. Um, yeah, we actually made a short movie. We didn't make a feature. Um, uh, the The company that we created is called Catalyst Media, and we were working in digital media and social media uh, projects. So what we did, and and the two of us, and then our other co founder, we all had backgrounds in education because we all met at Quinnipiac. Um, the film that we made uh, is a short film. It's called Protesters. Uh, and if you want to watch it, you can actually check it out. It's on my website if you go to martylang.com. Um, it's a 10 minute film and it deals with abortion and how one family deals with the decision of a family member who decides she's going to have one. Um, we made that film to play, you know, in festivals and to, to hopefully, you know, get an audience online, that sort of thing. But we actually had another path for it, uh, for revenue generation. We were going to offer it to schools and co uh, colleges and universities to play for their freshmen. So that if you take a class, uh, a lot of colleges offer classes now that are sort of like, you know, uh, university of whatever 101, where you kind of get an introduction to college life. Part of those classes, in a lot of cases, we did some research, a lot of those classes deal with, you know, viewpoints that are different from your own on um, social issues, uh, you know, d d all sorts of things. So we made that film with the hope that we could go to a college and say, look, we'd like you to play this in your, you know, Q Quinnipiac 101 class, for example. You know, if you have three or 400 kids taking that class, you can pay us X dollars per, uh, per student, and then we'll give you a license to show that film in your class. So we made it not only as a, a chance to tell a story, but as a way to, you know, kind of make some money in the educational market too. That's a pretty good idea. Yeah. And, uh, so, you know, I, I work at a college, so, you know, I, I've, I, you know, can see the, uh, the appeal to that too. And because I, I, I actually have seen movies that have come in, they've shown it to like, they've run out the theater that we have there and, you know, 
play for like 300 people. Yeah, it's it's really cool, you know, incorporating, you know, visual storytelling into college classes. It's is really a great way to get students engaged, to promote discussion, um, you know, and, and it really kind of gets them. It's it's something different than sitting and listening to a lecture. You know, yeah, everyone has those memories of when they were in school. You know, you're listening to the, the the older teacher rambling on about something that you really don't care about and falling asleep in class and things like that. If you're watching a movie, it's a little bit different. And if it's a short movie, it's the kind of thing where you can incorporate discussion into that class instead of showing a two hour film and then not having time to talk about anything. So it is kind of the best of all worlds. Yeah, I remember a professor I had in college. And I mean, this guy would lecture from the minute the class started to the absolute fun, uh, <laughs> final seconds, yeah. and literally, like kids would be just like in their seats, man, just like putting their head down, rubbing their head. Like you could just tell they were like, "We got to get out of here." Like he would just he would just drone on, and and <laughs> there was no time for questions either. I mean, it was it was unbelievable. And I remember saying to myself, "My God, if I could." survive this i can survive a lot like mentally because this guy was was a test of of willpower well you know it's funny a, a, a number of teachers that i've had and and that i've known you know subscribe to that because they think of it as an as an opportunity to impart their their wisdom on the world and in a lot of cases you know they have a lot of good things to say but it's the approach is as much as it is the content so you know if you can show something that can you know get students emotionally engaged because like our film, you know, it's a film about abortion. Everyone has an opinion on that, you know, and they're not the same. So that it really encourages discussion when the film is done and really gets kids, you know, jazzed about, you know, what the topics are that, that you're dealing with. So I think it's a really effective way to teach to incorporate film into it. And also, uh, when you were a teacher, you taught crowdfunding. I did, yes. Um, right around the time that we made uh, my feature, Rising Star, I was uh, teaching crowdfunding as part of a writing and producing media class that I taught to upperclassmen. Um, and it really was, at the time, uh, it was pretty much just Kickstarter and Indiegogo. Um, and the kids took a little bit of time to get around to it because it was so new. But a couple of them really took to it and really enjoyed it. You know, the idea that, all right, well, if I can find a number of people that really support something that I want to make, you know, maybe I can make this happen. Uh, and when I first started teaching it, one of my students uh, who's gone on to become a close friend of mine, and he was actually the director of photography of the film protesters I just talked about, he was able to raise almost $1,000 for a documentary that he was making about a weightlifter. And he took, you know, all the tips I told him about finding the niche audiences and finding the places online that talk about those topics. And he found people that were giving him 50 bucks, 75 bucks, a hundred bucks that he didn't know. And that's, I mean, that's the definition of crowdfunding is going out and finding a crowd and having them support you. So, yeah. And, and as the years have gone on since then, you know, more and more kids at Quinnipiac have been crowdfunding their senior thesis projects. Um, and it's it's really been nice, you know, to to kind of see them run with that idea that, that I was teaching because at the time I was the only one teaching it. So the kids that are doing it now, they're pretty much all learned it from me. I'm, I'm really proud of that. Yeah, as you and I were talking about before, uh, you know, crowdfunding in that time was so new. And every time you brought it up to somebody, you would have to explain what it is. Um, you know, that's when I, I actually crowdfunded two movies, uh, one in 2009 on Indiegogo and then a second one in 2010, uh, TV pilot on Indiegogo. And it was, uh, pretty much a, a, just a labor of love to, because everyone kept saying, well, what is crowdfunding? Right. I mean, it, at that time it was as much about getting people to trust the fact that they could use their credit card on that site as it was, you know, figuring out what it was that you were doing, you know, you know, luckily, you know, we're at the point now where crowdfunding is so much, so much more ubiquitous and so much, so much more well publicized. People understand it a lot more now, you know, because of, you know, your Veronica Mars and Zach Braff and Spike Lee and people like that using crowdfunding uh, to make money for their projects. You know, back then, yeah, it was, it was a slog to try to get people to get interested in it. It really was tough. 
Yeah, I, I remember uh, I had explained to a woman that, yeah, it was okay to use your credit card. Uh, you know, this isn't a scam site or anything like that. <laughs> and, um, you know, I, I was talking to Shan, uh, Sherry Candler Moss about this, and she even said, you know, people weren't conditioned back then to spend money on Facebook. Because if you posted something, people were like, I don't come on, on Facebook to, you know, make a, a micro purchase or something like that. You know, I, I'd come on Facebook to, you know, at that time, you know, either play, you know, uh, play a game or, uh, to, you know, talk to someone or, you know, see whatever messages I have. But now you go into Facebook. I mean, now Facebook's getting into like becoming almost like a PayPal. We could send people money. Uh, last year, up to until last year, you could buy gifts on Facebook. Yeah. And the other thing, too, you got to remember is, you know, the rise of smartphones has had a lot to do with this, too. Back then, you know, not many, you know, I mean, obviously nowhere near as many people had smartphones then as they do now. But now as we're getting into an age of, you know, Apple Pay and things like that, where your phone is slowly becoming your wallet, that's going to make a big impression for crowdfunding, too, because you're at the point where you can do one click donations, you know, one click backing, you know, things like that. The easier it becomes through the technology that we're using, the more people are going to get involved with it, I think. Yeah, very true. Yeah. Uh, and, and you know, funny note about that. I was actually reading a, uh, an article that uh, you know a lot of people in Greece, particularly, don't actually use credit cards or debit cards or whatever. They all use cash. And if you remember, a couple of years ago, they had that whole Greece uh, credit crisis. Yep. And the author, his hypothesis was because so many people use cash over there, you have doctors living in homes over there who. Are, they're multi-million dollar homes and, they, and these doctors say we only make like $50,000 a year. So because they couldn't track it anymore because everyone paid cash for everything. Huh. Well, that's – wow. That's – I hadn't heard about that. Yeah, it's – the the way the money flows, you know, that, that determines who's financially successful, you know. And I think it – obviously it's going to head more and more towards, you know, digital and, you know, credit payment, you know. Yeah, and with the microtransactions now, because pretty much everything is is becoming a microtransaction, uh, from your video game, you know, if you want the rest of the levels, to you know, um, uh, like some some of the Amazon games I've seen too, or it's uh, some of the apps. Excuse me, some of the apps I've seen, like the fitness apps. You know, hey, you want all the exercises? Well, you know, you have to buy the rest of them. Right. Right. Yeah. The more the more you can incorporate a transaction into something that's not going to a store. You know what I mean? The more, uh, what's the word? Seamless. You know, it can it can become through your daily life. You know, the the more those people will will be successful. So, Marty, what was your first project that you ever crowdfunded? Uh, the first project I ever crowdfunded was Rising Star, uh, the feature that we made. That was the first one. So, could you take us through that? You know, how you actually started the whole process? Yeah, um, we had there was a. Uh, a team of three people that sort of oversaw the campaign. It was uh, it was me. It was our lead actor. Uh, his name is Gary Plosky, and our producer Matt Giovannucci. The three of us had gotten together, and we really, you know, we didn't we didn't think so much in terms of let's go out and build a crowd before we did this. We kind of jumped into it because we already had a crowd of sorts. Uh, the three of us had worked together over a couple of years previous to the film. Uh, we used to have to, to get back to education a little bit. We used to run a, a summertime workforce development program in the state of Connecticut. Uh, it was called the Connecticut Film Industry Training Program. And we brought in New York film people that were in the Directors Guild and that were in IATSE. And we brought them in to work as instructors to teach state residents how to be location scouts, assistant directors, script supervisors, all those you know below the line crew positions. So over three years, we taught about 350 people. So we thought that if we were going to make this film, we could use that group as our crowd. And then hopefully they would be the ones to buoy us and, and give us the money that we needed to get going on the film. So we went ahead and we started a Kickstarter campaign. It was a 45-day campaign. Uh, we started it, I want to say it was the beginning of August, I think it was. And uh, we went for six weeks. Uh, we made we made a pitch video that was about six minutes long, so it was really long. Um, but what we did was we tried to 
kind of emphasize the fact that we're involving our community in making the film. So I talked in the pitch video a little bit about uh, the film ministry training program and how we were going to take a lot of the people graduating from that and hire them on as crew. Uh, we actually also worked with um, a Hartford, Connecticut based uh, performing arts middle school. Uh, we went over to there and this was totally just us being altruistic. We went over to the school and we taught free filmmaking classes for their seventh and eighth grade multimedia students. Um, we got involved with the city of Hartford because we we're going to be filming primarily there. Uh, and, you know, they were a hundred percent behind the film and, you know, they, you know, kind of vouched it for us and gave us access for things to do. You know, we were, we were able to shoot at any street in town just by letting the police know we were going to be there or any park, which was great. Um, and then we just went ahead and every day, we basically just did the hard work of emailing people and calling people and, you know, and letting them know about the film and trying to get them to, to help support us. And it worked. Um, we had uh, 176 backers. We had our goal was uh, $15,000 and we raised about 15 to uh, 200. So we were a little bit over our goal. But yeah, it turned out um, about 84% of our backers were people that we knew. Um, so we were lucky, you know, we, we knew, we kind of knew about what the upper limit was for what we'd be able to raise from our own crowd. And then we got a lot of other people that had heard about it, you know, while we were on talking on podcasts like this, you know, when we were doing tweet-a-thons and things like that, you know, we, we got the indie film community, uh, you know, interested in it, you know, beyond ourselves. So that's how we did it. So how <laughs> meticulously did you plan the pre-launch? We had, there were a couple of video updates that we had done before leading up to the campaign. Um, we had started a Facebook page, I want to say maybe two or three months before the campaign started. Um, and I had just gotten on Twitter again, about a couple months before we launched. So the pre-launch stuff was more about kind of making, making myself comfortable speaking for me, uh, making myself comfortable with the tools that we were going to use. Um, I, I didn't really, I wasn't really that, that good on YouTube, for example, Gary was outstanding at it. He was constantly working on it. He had also been on Twitter about two years previous to that. So he really taught me, you know, kind of the basics of how to use that site. Um, you know, Matt had, you know, he spent his time sort of building up his connections. He's, uh, his father is big in the Italian community, last name Gibanucci. Um, so he was able to, you know, kind of rile up people, you know, through his dad's Unico, uh, club and get them interested in it and stuff. So by the time we hit a lot of people knew it was coming. So that really helped us. We had a, we had a big first two days. I want to say, I think we got like 28% in the first two days or something like that. It was pretty high. Um, and then, yeah, things kind of just kind of went from there. So, you know, how did you actually create your, your goal? Like, how did you know uh, uh, how much you were going to need? Was it just, did you just take the above and below the line costs and combine them together? Um, you know, or did you know, did you actually plan for, hey, we need extra money just in case, you know, anything surprising comes up? We actually didn't. Um, we, we had come up with a number that was a little higher than what we were going to need, um, for the campaign to finish the film. And I basically, I basically said, look, you know, we're, we're going to go over, I'll cover whatever we go over because I had a little bit of money in the bank and I, I just really wanted to make the movie. So we thought 15 was a number that we could reach. So we figured let's get that. And then that would get us through production. And then whatever money we needed for post, I would take care of when we got there. And it pretty much worked out that way. Uh, that 15000 got us about, I'd say about 90% through production. I had to put in a couple hundred bucks, you know, for little things that popped up. Um, but we, we had no contingency. And that was something that I wish we had. Um, I'll definitely put, you know, build that in for, for the next campaign. So do you think that was the, you know, your biggest quote unquote mistake? Uh, you know, everything's a learning experience, you know, and, and do you think that that was, you know, the biggest learning experience uh, was not having a contingency plan? Well, there's a couple of things we learned from it. You know, I, I think having contingency is a requirement, you know, for any film. And, and I know that now. Um, I think I'm trying to think what else what else we learned from it. Um you know, one of the I, one of the perks that we offered actually gave us a really good learning experience. We um, we offered a perk at forty two dollars. We came up with the idea for uh, a viral video 
that we would make for anyone that would give us $42 or more in the campaign. And we had our one of our lead actors, uh, his name is Michael Barra. Uh, he's great. He's been on Law & Order. He's been in The Amazing Spider-Man. He's such a talented actor. Um, he worked with our producer, Matt, to make videos that we called awesome videos. So if you give $42 to the campaign, we'll make a video for you for two minutes, three minutes talking about how awesome you are. You'd fill out a questionnaire just so we kind of get like the basics of who you are, anything that you'd want to talk about. And then we go out and we make a movie out of it. So we ended up doing probably seven or eight of them over the course of the campaign with the hope that when those videos would go out, more people would be interested in the campaign and they'd want one of their own. Um, it turned out it was so much work to get those movies made because they kept getting more and more complex and it was still good, but it, very time intensive. I don't think the benefit that we got from those videos was worth the time we put in making them. Um, I found later um, Gregory Bain uh, as a filmmaker, he's uh, he's doing a documentary called Bloodsworth. He had a great perk in his campaign where if he gave a certain amount of money, he would make you a 10 second video based on any word you choose. That to me was the right way to go about it because it was quick, you know, it was contained. It couldn't be that big production wise and it would still have a personal connection to people. So I think, I think that was a lesson we learned, you know, the media that you make over the course of the campaign really can't be that complicated was something that we learned. You know, I also see I'm, I'm on the uh, the Kickstarter page right now. I also see that you have a, a one person donated two thousand uh, dollars. Was that somebody you knew, or was that uh, just some sort of um, angel donor? That was someone that I knew. That was someone I went to high school with. Um, yeah, uh, that person won the lottery, <laughs> um, and I had I had talked to him. This is a couple months before the campaign. He won the lottery, and uh, I had asked him. You know, when the campaign started, I'm like, listen, you know, I'm not asking for a ton of money, but if you can give us something, it would be a huge help, you know. And I was expecting just, you know, like a couple hundred or something. And he put in two thousand dollars. So, yeah, that was unbelievably cool. Yeah. So, so, so he won the lottery. Like, did he win it like a, a couple years before? A couple months before. Really? Do you know, do you know how much he won? Uh, it was over a million. I, I forget exactly how much it was. But yeah, he he did pretty well. <laughs> it was usually you hear stories of people win the lottery; they just pull up the stakes and head out somewhere else. You know, uh, yep. it's good they still you know you still it was good you still had contact with him. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, he was a cool guy. We hung out. We were in high school. We played basketball a lot. You know, he's he's good friends with some of my best friends. So yeah, we we've always stayed in touch. Did he attend the private screening? He did. Yes, he did. Yep. Oh, cool. That's awesome. Um, you know, because it's just interesting. You know, you, you never seem to know where where this is going to lead you. Because you know, I, I've heard stories too, and I'm sure you've heard this as well. There are sometimes angel donators. Now, I'm not saying angel. Uh, I'm not saying that's going to happen to everybody, obviously. But you know, every so often, like you, I mean, you won the lottery, in, in, in a matter of speaking, because you had some guy be able to give you two thousand um, dollars. You know, case in point. Uh, another case in point is I had a friend of mine. He was running a crowdfunding campaign. His goal was, I think, five thousand, mm -hmm. and he barely scratched the surface. And I, I, you know, tried to help him. And I went to sleep that night, and it was his last day. And I said, you know, buddy, best of luck to you. And uh, I woke up the next morning, and I had an email from Crowd uh, from Kickstarter, and it said, "Congratulations, because of you." This, and I said, "What?" <laughs> I go, "He he was able to raise four thousand some odd dollars." So I'm looking, and he didn't even have ten backers. Oh wow. And I said, what the hell? Yeah. So I, I – of course, I call him up and I said, what the hell happened last night? Um, he said somebody from a charity event that he worked at heard about the campaign and at the 11th hour donated f uh, over $4,000. Oh, my god. Oh, my god. But you know what? That's that's the perfect story of crowdfunding. You know, it's – if you if you put the word out about something and somebody believes in it, it can come from anywhere. That's awesome. And, and immediately I was like, my God, man, I was like, you just hit the grand slam rarity where somebody literally, you know, uh, saves you at the last minute. And he's like, yeah, he's like, you know, what's the best part? He goes, he doesn't even want any of the perks. 
No, he didn't want anything in return. Uh, and I, I was his only backer who was like, hey, where's my perk at, buddy? I want that DVD. Oh, my God. <laughs> you know, that's that's so interesting. We we did have, a, uh, I'd say, maybe three or four backers that gave uh, a couple hundred dollars or more. And I think they were all like that, too. They didn't want any perks. You know, they just wanted to support the project. It really it really is amazing, you know, that, you know, there's people like that out there and, and they want to help you know, help create works of art, you know, like this. That's great. Yeah, yeah and it's, it's a good message to everyone listening. Uh, it's always good to have very rich friends. Yeah, that never hurts. <laughs> never hurts. So that, that's our lesson today. <laughs> Get rich friends okay. and you can craft fun a movie yourself. No, but, uh, <laughs> but you know, it, it's very good because what we're saying is you never know who from your network whether you know someone you met once or someone you met, met uh, you know a couple of times, how, you know, or someone you went to high school with, you never know who is interested in helping. Um, that's why it's always good to have a very large email list. Right, and and it also reminds you of the golden rule. You know, just treat people nice because you know you never know you never know where help can come from. You know, it's it's just a good reminder. That's, yeah, very true. You know? So, you know, Marty, uh, you know, as I'm looking again at this campaign, I see your, your top perk uh, was twenty eight dollars. And, um, you know, you know I, and that makes a lot of sense, too, because most of the time, twenty five is like that median level. Uh, you know, that seems to be the absolute you know average across the board, whether, you know, it's Seed and Spark or Kickstarter, Indiegogo. Uh, you know, did, did you know, did you, were you surprised at, at some of the higher level backing that you had? I mean, because you, you have twenty eight backers at fifty two dollars. Uh, you had a hundred uh, excuse me you had 15 backers at the hundred dollar level so were you were you surprised when you started getting backers above 25 you know i i really didn't know what to expect um it was the first time that we had ever gone through doing something like this um i i thought you know one of the things that that i was you know pretty adamant about was we need to have lower backer amounts because frankly a lot of my friends were broke you know so if there if there was an opportunity for them to get involved at a lower level i thought that would help and it would keep you know what I mean? it, would, it would just keep people getting on board you know even if it's at lower levels okay then we just have to worry about doing more work to get more of them we got lucky you know obviously with our with our two thousand dollar backer we had um we had one one thousand dollar backer um and then we had, you know, I think three or four that were around $300, three to 500. Um, the guy who, uh, who ran the, um, the Connecticut film industry training program, who was my boss, um, he actually put $500 into the campaign. He never told me he was going to do it. You know, he just did it. And that floored me. So, you know, it's, you know, we, we didn't know, I was hoping that there would be some people that would put in a little bit more money, but this is the first time that we had ever done it. So I really had no basis for comparison. Yeah, it's very cool that you know. Again, somebody from your background, who you know, from your network, and you know, like like, like you just said, Marty, always being nice to people. You never know who's going to end up helping you. Uh, it really is, uh, you know, you know, very sh- uh, very surprising sometimes. Yeah, you know, and it it, it shows, yeah, it, people people inherently are good. You know, I I tend to be a cynical person, so I forget that a lot. But that campaign really taught me, you know, there's there's a lot of really great people in the world and they want to help. So, you know, if you know, if you can create something that is exciting to them and that makes them feel like they're a part of the creation of the work that you're doing, they'll help you. They'll get involved. So, so Marty, when you were promoting this, you know, uh, what, what sort of social media platforms did you use and you know, how frequently you know, were, were you posting on these sites? Well, we had uh, – we I think there were four major sort of spots that we were promoting from. We had an official website, uh, which is still up. That's risingstarmovie.com. Uh, and then we had a Twitter feed, a YouTube page, and uh, a Facebook page. And those were kind of like the major – social media outlets at the time. So we sort of focused on those. Um, Gary did a lot with, um, with creating video updates over the course of the campaign that would start on Kickstarter for backers, you know, then would go to YouTube and then would be embedded on the other two. So the workflow was pretty simple because we didn't have too many of them. Um, you know, and then, it was just communicating with people, you know, and trying to, to find other people. One, one big thing that I did, um, 
I, Gary was pretty much, you know, in charge of the social media stuff. And, and Matt was working on that too, while we were going, I spent a lot of time basically meeting up with all the people that I went to high school with, you know, friends of mine that lived in my hometown, friends of my parents, you know, basically, you know, everyone who I met, you know, I was basically kind of doing the real life version of an email list where I was calling people up and saying, listen, have you heard about this? You know, cold calling people that I'm friends with, but but cold calling and letting them know about it and sort of walking them through and and trying to convince them to do it. And we raised, I'd say, close to a thousand dollars doing that, you know, in real world ways just finding, you know, friends that, that wanted to be a part of it. Because the other thing too, you got to remember back then, you know, the internet is obviously growing exponentially. So it was a lot smaller in terms of reach in 2010 than it is now. So for a lot of older folks, especially, you know, they didn't know how to get online or they didn't have a Facebook page. So they didn't know about what was going on. So I really had to, you know, take the time to call a lot of these people and and get them on board. You know, my dad was actually an example of that. He knew the campaign was going because I told him about it. But once it started up, he didn't know how to get involved. So, you know, I literally like I had to go over the house and I like went through it and went online with them and showed them how to sign up and create a Kickstarter account. And, you know, and he had an account with, um, with Amazon at the time. So he was comfortable putting his credit card in, you know, because it was an online purchase and he was nervous about that. So, it, you know, it, it takes, it takes as much real life interaction with people as it does, you know, online, I think. So, so if you were to, you know, crowdfund, you know, uh, maybe even this year, crowdfund a project, you know, wh- what were some of the things that maybe you would do different or do you think that are uh, uh, viable now? So, so to speak, like you and I were talking about Hootsuite before yeah. to sort of, you know, time tweets, you know, uh, what would you have done? What would you do differently now uh, if, you, if you actually could start a, if you were going to start a project this year? And maybe you are. <laughs> I don't know. Well, I'm, I'm, I'd love to. I'm actually. I'm thinking I might. Um, and if if I do, it would be for another feature film. the The idea this time is that I would treat the campaign as if it were making a film itself. Um, that's the one thing that we didn't do during Rising Star. Like when we finished our campaign for Rising Star, two weeks later we were in production. We had no time at all. We just moved from one thing to the next thing. Um, this time I, I would, you know, take the time. I actually, the, the last two weeks I've been spending time building up my email list. Um, and I'm over a thousand emails right now. So that's something I didn't have last time. So now I have a big base to pull from to start with. Right. Uh, I would also do the work of finding all of the, uh, the blogs and all the podcasts and all the online places that I think fans of the film would be looking at and would be going to. Uh, and I would make connections with them far before when the campaign starts. Uh, that would allow me then to actually put together kind of like a press schedule. So I would know, okay, on day 13, I'm going to talk with Dave Bullis because I know my crowdfunding you know, pals are going to be listening to that. So that would be a boost to get to this group of people that I want to get to. Um, you know, I, and another thing that that's really important, you know, uh, John Tregonis, uh, who works at Indiegogo, he talks about different groups of people that can help you, you know, during your campaign, like no one can crowdfund alone. And he says, you know, the, the filmmaking team is one group. Um, your interns are another group and your crowd is your third group. I would love to have uh, a college class that I could teach about crowdfunding that would incorporate them actually working on the campaign as it's happening. Um, you know, you get a, a group of 10 college kids in a classroom, you know, you spend a, a month leading up to the beginning of a campaign, teaching them the basics of a campaign, how it works, uh, how the marketing works and how the outreach works. And then once the campaign starts, you can have them working and getting in touch with people and finding people that they think might be interested in, in getting involved in the campaign and get in touch with them personally, get into a Twitter conversation with them through the official you know, account of the film or you know, uh, spread a hashtag around to people that they think might want to back it. Um, really just spend the time to build up that, that critical mass of people so that when you start the campaign, you're not looking for people you're making sure that everyone you've already told has already backed. That's a very different approach than we did for the last one, because for the last one, it was as much about finding the people as it was, you know, making sure that they had backed. 
I want to go into a campaign the next time knowing for a fact that I'm going to have 200 people backing it on the first day. That's going to make me feel a lot better. It's going to give, you know, more of an impression of inevitability that the film's going to succeed. Um, and it's, it's just going to create a lot more buzz. So that's, I, I would definitely do it a lot differently where I had to do it again. You know, uh, you know, uh, something that Eli, Eli Rigolato, who I had on the podcast, he talked about um, having ambassadors mm -hmm. and having ambassadors meaning if when you're in pre-launch, uh, you actually have these ambassadors and say, hey, would you in exchange for you know whatever the piece of product or a copy of the movie or et cetera, would you – Go out and actually promote the movie actively. Promote the crowdfunding campaign. You know, go uh, maybe even people who are influencers. Go to their their blog and say, "Hey, check out this movie," or uh, something along those lines. And uh, he told the story that he was um, uh, crowdfunding a uh, for some some kind of peripheral. For some, uh, it was actually I think a piece of technology. And uh, some girl brought it up to him, and she said, "You know, I used to be in the in the fashion community." And um, when you know we did like things something like this, we had a fifty percent, fifty percent of uh, people said yes, and he said no. Oh, fifty people. She said no percent, meaning you know. So that's I mean, one out of every two people said yes, and you know it was amazing because they just gave them the products and they went off and they they told people about them. And I figured that would work pretty well for film if you find out like especially horror. Uh, if you actually making a horror film, I mean horror blogs and, and horror social on horror on social media. I have constantly have uh, zombie films following me or zombie blogs or, or you know what have you. Mm. I can I can imagine the the just the simple power of t turning even even ten percent of those of, of those groups into ambassadors, and I mean that would amplify your message exponentially. Oh, absolutely, and I mean that's that's just smart, you know, to find out you know what, what you you need to know what your film's about. You need to know who are the already existing entities, you know, whether it's a blog or whether it's a magazine or a fashion group or whatever, you know, who can connect with those people. And then, I mean, the goal literally is become friends with them. And and like you say, you know, uh, you know, propose, you know, if if I give you X, you know, will you go out and promote this film? And, you know, a lot of times if it's a media based entity they're going to like that because then that's content that they can send out to their people that they don't have to make. You know, I mean, I, I used to work, you know, as a reporter, as a journalist and, you know, a lot of times, you know, the work I was able to get in film, some of it was like promotional work and like PR work because I know I can write press releases and I can get content out there, you know, entities, if, if you, and again, you know, if you can do something that they don't have to pay you for, then they're a lot more willing to help you, you know, and, and let them do things with you. So yeah, no, that, that makes a lot of sense. And it's also about bringing value to those people too, because some of the people that, you know, may have not heard about them now can hear about them because of your project and, uh, and vice versa. So it's sort of cross pollinating audiences. Yeah. And you know, the, the collective idea is something that I think is really, you know, a, a popular thing now. I mean, there are film collectives that are making movies in groups. You know, you think of like borderline films. They made Martha Marcy, May Marlene. That's a group of three film directors. They alternate, you know, when they make their films, you know, and it's the same thing when it comes to crowdfunding, that collective idea, you know, that really, that builds a lot of goodwill. And, and uh, yeah, exactly. And you know that that's something that you know once you start to harness and you know, build that credibility and, and talk to them. It, it, social media is great for that, especially Twitter, and just reaching out to people. You know, and looking up a hashtag zombie. Uh, Trigonus and I talked about this hashtag go go zombie because there's so many zombie projects on the go go. <laughs> That if you created your own, if you created the Go Go Zombie, you could probably network with other people who've made zombie films. Yeah, and you know they're not really competition, so to speak. They're more like because if, if you know if you're done mine and I'm done my, uh, and I'm starting mine, then you know hey hey this is what will work for us and this is what you know was good for us and this is how we made our posters and uh, you know stuff like that. It's it's a great thing if you find a community of like minded people, you know, that they will help you and in the best cases, you know, they can mentor you and they can sort of help you through if you're like if you're crowdfunding for the first time. That's that's one of the greatest things about making a film now as opposed to, you know, two thousand nine, two thousand ten. So many people have done it. So there's so many places you can go to get advice. Like it's it blows my mind, like the the resources that a, a new crowdfunder has at their disposal now. I just I just think it's awesome. 
Oh, oh yeah, I couldn't agree more. Uh, I mean, you type in crowdfunding into a search engine now, and it's it's unbelievable the hits you get. Uh, I actually was talking to you before about uh, before we started the podcast. I'm actually creating a Pinterest board. It's all going to be about crowdfunding, and it's going to be nothing. It's going to be a one stop resource. I mean, not just these podcasts, but it's going to be other articles that I found that I think are absolutely amazing, and you know, also things that. I know this isn't crowdfunding per se. It's about um, how to plan ROI on your movie through digital downloads, which is Jason Brubaker. He's been on the show three times, and cool. that's his thing. And I mean, he is just phenomenal at you know online uh, selling and how to distribute your movie. That's great. Yeah, I mean, distribution really is the next sort of uh, wall to fall. You know, as far as what, what indies can do for for monetizing their stuff, and it's not just online either. Like you think of a company like Tug. The fact that you can now do crowdsourced theatrical screenings across the country and around the world, I mean, that's that blows your mind. Like if you if you're good enough and if you can figure out to you know exactly enough where your audience is and the you know the markets and the areas where the, your type of film plays well, you can put together a successful theatrical run without a distribution deal. Like that to me is like it's it's unbelievable like the power that filmmakers have now should they choose to exercise it and really take control of their of building a relationship with their audience they can do amazing things now it's 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 incredible really yeah, it's it does make you think back to 2010. Of what you're saying, and it's like, my God, you know. Now, we, you know, we were struggling to tell people what crowdfunding even was. Now, and now, anyone who's never heard of crowdfunding, it's like, you know, where the hell have you been, man? <laughs> it's like you know, Spike Lee and uh, you know, um, uh, Zach Braff for crowdfunding. You know, yep. no, it's and it's great. You know, I, I know a lot of people. There was a lot of uh, controversy when those guys had done their Kickstarter campaigns. Like, why are they, you know, coming and begging for money kind of thing. But if you think about it, how many thousands of people were introduced to crowdfunding because of those campaigns? You know, Kickstarter, yeah. Kickstarter had a great stat um, after the Zach Braff campaign ran. I think, was it $4 million I think he was able to raise or just a, just under $4 million? Um, I, think, I think it was four. They Okay, they had said that another $400,000 was raised on Kickstarter for other projects from backers of Zach Braff. So that says to me, there's a whole bunch of people that didn't know anything about crowdfunding before, but now they dig it. That to me is outstanding. I, I think the more filmmakers can do things like that and the more people can get exposed to it, that's just going to help the, you know, everyone involved, I think. Yeah. And, and I wasn't mistaken. It was actually 3.1 that he raised 3.1 million. But, um, but yeah, I, I completely agree with you, Marty. And I wish, you know, even like Kevin Smith or I, I really hope Robert Rodriguez uh, would crowdfund. Um, you know, I'm actually uh, in the coming months. His cousin is going to come on. He wrote, uh, co-wrote uh, Machete oh. and Machete Kills, and uh, I'm I, I want to pitch that idea to him. I'm going to pitch him the idea that to get his cousin Robert Rodriguez to come to to you know come on the podcast if he wants to, but no, uh, but to uh, crowdfund. And, you know, I think he could do pretty well on there. Oh, I think so, too. I mean, Rodriguez is the perfect example of, you know, making a film by any means necessary. You know, I mean, he's built he's built an empire out of that. That's awesome. No, that would be a great idea. And the first book I ever got on filmmaking was his book, Rebel Without a Crew. Um, for In Christmas 2008, my parents got me a little digital camera. It was like 90 bucks and that book, and I proceeded to make my first student film. And I don't have – I, I, I didn't go to film school, um, so everything was either learned through books and by doing. And um, uh, basically, I learned a hell of a lot through making that film. And uh, I, every day, I kept a journal what we did and what I need to improve on. And uh, I've done that ever since. And uh, a lot of it is finding dependable people because uh, I've had directors of cinematography no show and these guys like they had their own gear too so it was like it wasn't like they just decided wanted to be a cinematographer and um, turns out what happened was his own movie that he had just shot basically the editor was holding it hostage and he was so burned out on movies that he apparently said he didn't want to uh, talk to me about it he just decided to say hell with it, everything and uh, I actually ended up talking to him about two years ago, and um, he, he that's where I found out all about this stuff. And I was like, man, I wish you would have said something because we never finished that movie. It's it's tough. You know, finding dependable people in the independent micro-budget film world is a real challenge. And I, I think one of the things, you know, I, I've found if the more you can build, you know, a, a sense of community and a sense of um, – 
uh, mentorship, I think is a, is a good way to look at, you know, kind of building trust in the indie film world. A lot of the students that I had when I was at Quinnipiac, after they graduate, I'd try to help them find jobs or I'd give them internships working for me, you know, and, and then they'd go off and they'd do other things. You know, one of my old students is a, is an assistant location manager now on a show called unforgettable. And I mean, he's like just tearing up the world right now, but I call him up, you know, and I, I can go to set and hang out with him, And, you know, and he really, you know, and he tells me, you know, if you ever need any help, just let me know, you know, a lot of this, you know, kind of, you know, building those people that you can trust, comes with helping them too, you know, and, and it takes a little bit longer. And, you know, in my own experience, it took me a real long time. It took me over five years. Um, but it really paid dividends because I knew when it came time to make the movie, I knew the people that were working with me were going to stick with me because I helped them. You know, that's, that's a big, that's a big thing that can help, I think. Oh yeah, absolutely. I, I agree a hundred percent. Um, and, and you, you know, like certain people that I've met, um, when I first started, you know, now they're assistants out in LA and then they've become, you know, some of them have gone on to different agencies. Some of them have actually have managers now. Um, yeah, it, it's amazing. It's absolutely, it, you know, and, and this is why I don't burn bridges with people. Like I'm always like, you know, Hey, uh, you know, I never, I always make sure after every project, everyone is sort of in a, in a good spot. Um, you know, sometimes there is friction on a set, you know, that's, that's, that's understandable. Um, but you know, uh, you know, as we were talking about before the podcast started, there is sometimes where, you know, it, it does, you know, sometimes two people can't work together as I was telling you my story about yeah, that. <laughs> no, you're right. Now, sometimes there's nothing you can do about it, you know? Um, but you know, you hope, you hope that the people that you have on board, you know, are, are committed to the project like you are and, you know, we'll do what they need to, to help see it through, you know? Oh yeah, absolutely. And you know, that, that's the trick. That's why when people find a crew they like, they stick with that crew. And I, I never understood that, but it's why Tim Burton works with the same people again and again. It's why John Carpenter works with the same people again and again, uh, Tarantino, yeah. you know, and even, even the Coen brothers. That's why it's always seems to be the same group of people, but there's a reason for that now. And I, I, I completely understand that. Oh now. yeah. No, the, the greatest thing is when you get a crew of people that you know, and that you work with a lot, there's, there's a shorthand that develops, you know what I mean? Where you, you kind of know what the other person wants. Um, I, I work with a composer, a friend of mine from high school, and we've worked together on three projects. And we're at the point now where what he gives me for a first version of a score is so much closer to what I want than what it was the first time we worked together. And it just makes sense. You know, the more you work with someone, the more you figure out their rhythm and you figure out what they like and don't like. And, you know, you can kind of work a little quicker, you know, because you have that experience. Yeah, and that's, yeah, that's great too to be able to know what someone's thinking too. Be like, oh, you know, uh, I, you know, if I was, you know, your cinematographer, I'd be like, oh, Marty usually likes this shot, you know, and, and you know, go from there. And and also, I think it's very important to have that relationship with actors too. I think just finding actors and you find out, you know, this person's talented, and but you know, they're insane. So we can't work <laughs> with them. But you know, but you find actors who are really talented who are very sane. You know, uh, Greg Francis and I talked a lot about directing actors in, in the last podcast because you know he was a little worried because when he got to set, you know, are these guys gonna be okay? You know, this and that. You know, things. You know, when 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 um you're sort of doing rehearsals. That's one thing. But when you finally get on set and everyone sort of feels a pressure. You know what I mean? Like, you know, we got to we got to make time. We got to get this thing in the can. Then, you know, tempers can start flaring. But he said it was great, you know, and um, he had no problems. And, you know, that's always good to hear, you know, when, when everybody can work together. Oh, absolutely. And, and, you know, one way that's that's really good to, to find out who those people are is to work on other sets. You know, the, the more you can kind of ingratiate yourself in a production community, you can find out who those people are that are good under pressure. Those people who are, you know, very needy and, you know, always have to be, you know, coached through every take as opposed to going out there and knowing exactly what they want to do. You know, people who are responsive to, uh, to direction and not responsive, all those kinds of things. You know, you learn that by working on sets that are not your own, you know, and then if you strike up friendships with those people, you can bring them onto things that you're working on. Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, Kelly Baker and I were talking about it too. He was on the podcast, and uh, he mentioned that. And um, you know, he 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 went on to do uh, uh, you know uh, audio mixing for Gus Van Zant. He does all of Gus Van Zant's movies. Very cool. And um, you know, that's I, I would love to work with him one day just to mix sound because um, I mean he's phenomenal at it. 
And, you know, he always has his crew, crew of guys that he works with. Um, if you do get a chance, by the way, Marty, listen to that podcast because he has one of the most horrendous uh, stories about making your first really? film. Uh, yeah, he actually lost his house. Oh, my God. Yeah. Oh, my God. And it, it is like – the worst uh, story about that I've ever heard. I actually ha- – he- the movie was complete. I have it right behind me. You can't see me, but it's on a bookcase. But um, he actually ended up losing his house because of it. Oh, my God. I, that I'll tell you something. I was so nervous making Rising Star. I, I, I made it a point that I wasn't going to go into debt making the movie. Like I, I had enough saved up where I could pay for things up front. Man, I that kept me. That fear was with me the whole time making that movie. Oh, I feel so bad for that guy. Yeah, yeah, and and it was because of that because he went into debt so much um, for for making it. Uh, but yeah, if if you ever get you ever know, ever get the chance, uh, I, I really recommend you listen to that podcast. Yeah. Um, I don't. <laughs> I told him before. I said, Kelly, no one's ever had that that heartbreaking of a story yeah. ever. Uh, but um, it still is the, the you know such a incredible learning experience for everybody. Yeah. Um. But but you know um, you know one of the questions more just to you know switch gears on a more positive note you know one of the questions I got you know um, I know you know you probably have to go soon so I'm only going to you know uh, ask you two questions from the audience if you sure, don't mind you know uh, one of the questions was uh, Marty should I go union or non-union for my first feature film um, well there's two different pieces of that um, when you say do I go union or non-union. You're talking in terms of the crew, and then you're also talking in terms of the cast. Um, There are two completely different uh, unions, and there's two completely different um, approaches that you can do, right? Or three, actually. You could go where you're going to pay all kinds of money, and you're going to get a union crew, a really good crew, and you're going to get a Screen Actors Guild union cast, and you're going to have great people in it. That's one way to do it. That's the most expensive. It'll probably be the most efficient because everybody knows what they're doing, but it'll be by far the most expensive. Um, You could do, I'm going to have a a union crew and a non-union cast. That's going to cost you a lot of money, but you're going to be missing the benefit of having actors that are union and that are professionals and also missing out on the opportunity to have name actors in your cast. I don't recommend that at all. Um, You can do a union cast and a non-union crew. And that gives you the benefit of outstanding actors. And it gives you uh, a money savings because one non-union crews cost a lot less than union crews. And the screen actors guild has a contract where you can make a feature film for $200 or less, $200,000 or less. And you only have to pay actors $125 a day. That's what I would recommend. Um, if you're if you're making a film that you think you know would have a future on video on demand or, or that you want to try to get a, a traditional distribution deal for, I would do that. I would work with SAG actors and a non-union crew. That's that's probably the way to go. Or if you're making a feature for the first time and you just want to make it for the sake of making it, um, you can always shoot with a non-union crew and a non-union cast. Um, you know the the more you know, the, the more union you go, the generally the higher the talent level goes, but then the price goes up as well. Um, in my experience, sort of the, the happy medium for that is to work with uh, a union cast and a non-union crew. So I would, I'd recommend that. All right, very cool. All right, very cool. And, uh, that kind of answered the second qu- part of that question as well. Um, so, so to wrap up, Marty, uh, is there any other new projects you're working on? Well, I've got a couple things. Um, I, uh, I'm getting back into journalism a little bit. I'm actually doing blog posts now for the crowdfunding website, Seed and Spark. Uh, I do some stuff for them and I'm back in writing. I've got two feature film projects that I'm, that I'm writing right now, uh, and a TV pilot that I'm writing too. And hopefully, you know, by, uh, by the end of this year, you know, I'll, I'll have something that I can, I think I can start, you know, getting, uh, getting out in the world. So hopefully that'll, that'll happen this year. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, so where can people find you at? Well, my, uh, my new website is now all up and that's at www.martylang.com. M-A-R-T-Y-L-A-N-G. Uh, that's got my bio. That's got scripts that I've written. If you want to read them, uh, it's got uh, different examples of work that I've done. Um, all, all sorts of things about me. If you're interested, uh, you can find a lot of stuff there. I'm on Twitter, uh, at Marty underscore Lang. Um, and, uh, those are places pretty much you can find me the most. 
Cool. And uh, Morning, I want to thank you very much for coming on. Um, you know, everyone, you can find me at DaveBolas.com, Twitter, it's at Dave underscore Bolas. And, uh, you know, Marty, thanks a lot. And uh, if you never need anything, let me know. Sounds good. Thanks, man. Appreciate coming up. No problem. Take care, buddy. Find Dave at DaveBolas.com. Please make sure to subscribe and share the podcast.